Okay. Um, so Jeffina was just asking me some questions. So I thought maybe we can uh, start with, if anyone has questions, we'll start first with uh, Jeffina's questions. And then if anyone else has any, we can talk about that as well. Uh, yeah, Jeffina can go ahead. So um, I just want a little more explanation on verse five, where it says, uh, do you want to ask me about that? Yeah. Okay. So uh, I just want a little more explanation on verse five, where it says, therefore judge nothing before the time. Until the Lord comes, who will bring both light, the hidden things of darkness, and reveal the counsels of the heart. So, whom does it actually talk about? Whose hidden things? Whose counsel of the heart? Does it talk about the end time judgment? Or uh, I just want a little more understanding. Uh, so, this is um, apparently from chapter 5, verse 5. Um, so it says, therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes. Uh, so talking about Christ coming uh, to judge um, each of us, right? Final judgment. Uh, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the heart. Um, so here he's talking um, hidden things of darkness uh, might be things that we were doing in uh, hiding that nobody else knows about. Uh, so everyone else may be looking at uh, what we're doing outside, but they don't know what is happening in our lives behind closed doors. Uh, so the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the heart. So what is actually happening within the person's heart? Uh, so counsels is um, what is the motivation uh, what is the things that are driving them uh, and motivating them or leading them to do the things they do. So while the work they're doing may be very good, uh, they may be doing it with all the wrong reasons in their heart. So uh, we discussed this last week also, like uh, what kind of material did we use to build uh, God's church, right? So all of that will be judged when Christ comes back. It will be proved uh, for what what we actually put in. So even though it may look good on the outside, only Jesus knows what's in our heart. And uh, that will be revealed on that last day. And we will be judged according to what was in our heart. So if uh, what motivated us was of our own flesh, uh, was for our own glory, uh, then we will not get any reward for our work. Uh, we will still be saved, like we talked about last week, mm -hmm. but there will no not be any other reward. So, yeah. Uh, anyone else wants to mention anything? Um, do you have a question or anything else that you want to share based on what we discussed from the first card for the first card? Okay, so we can move into the next part that we would uh, that we read before the break. For I think that God has displayed us, the apostles, last as men condemned to death. For we have been made a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. Uh, so, in this uh, culture, uh, there was the practice of taking uh, criminals or people who had been, whatever, imprisoned by the leaders. Uh, they would be put to death in an arena where there would be a crowd gathered around them to watch. Okay, so... Uh, if you all have heard of gladiators, uh, 
where there would be wild animals brought in and the person would be brought in and you're know, basically seeing the wild animals maul that person to death and it was actually considered entertainment uh, in that time um, uh, so here he's kind of bringing those pictures into play uh, and he's saying we are being brought as uh, we're being brought into this place last so usually that last place was reserved for the worst criminals okay so he's saying we have been treated in that way as the worst as the lowest kind of people uh, where you are boasting in your power all of those things uh, we are being we are uh, experiencing uh, this kind of treatment and uh, we are being brought into uh, the amphitheater or the arena uh, as people condemned to death and we are made a spectacle to all people um, to both angels and to men so before everyone um, we are being um, almost like uh, the suffering that we are going through is being watched and being seen by everybody okay um, verse 10 we are fools for christ's sake but you are wise in christ and so this is where he's drawing that contrast so you are boasting in your wisdom uh, but we are fools you are boasting in your strength but we are weak uh, you are seeking honor you are seeking um to be uh, elevated in the eyes of the world but we are dishonored uh, so in doing this he's uh, He's saying, don't run after these things. Like, so when if you are saying you are wise, uh, you're boasting in your wisdom, but that's not what we're seeking after. We want to be people sold out for Christ. And if that makes look like fools, that's OK. So you are boasting in your strength, uh, but uh, that's there is no strength that we have. We are completely weak. He talks about sharing the gospel in fear and trembling, right? So there, we have no strength in ourselves. It's only in the Holy Spirit. Uh, and so So, uh, in this verse, in verse, yeah.
Hi, I'm very sorry. I, there was some problem and the connection just dropped. Uh, but I think we're okay now. Okay, uh, Jafina was going to ask a question. Yeah, so in verse 10, we were looking at how uh, he was saying, we are weak in Christ, but you consider yourself as strong. But uh, in the starting, uh, where it says, we are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ, it says. So that kind of makes me wonder. But because in other things, it doesn't say you are strong in Christ or uh, you are distinguished in Christ. Mm -hmm. But in the first part alone, it says you are wise in Christ, which doesn't look, for me, it doesn't look like he's putting them down, like you're considering yourself as wise because somehow in Christ has been added. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering, like, how could it? Yeah, so um, that is verse 10, right? Yeah, but you are wise in Christ. Uh, so they were boasting in their uh, leaders, right? They were boasting in Apollos, they were boasting in Paul. Uh, so what they were saying is uh, these leaders whom God has given us are my leader is wiser than your leader. And because I follow this leader, I am in some way better than you or more i'm wiser than you so wise in christ is uh, wise in my knowledge of christ like i know christ better than you uh, my understanding of christ is better than yours um, so that's where the competition was right they were finding uh, that sense of status in their um, teachers wisdom or teaching so, like all of these things are actually very, very um, relevant for us today. Uh, it's very common, and I think it creeps into our own hearts very easily. Where uh, I, I can confess that I have many times been guilty of this, where uh, I feel like I know more than somebody else, and I, I find myself being proud about it. Right? Because I know something that uh, somebody else doesn't know. But uh, why do I know it? I know it because God has in some way gifted me with that knowledge. So he's given me the opportunity to learn it through someone. He's given me the resources to learn it in some way. So there's no, this is that point that Paul is trying to make. There is actually no room for pride because everything is from Christ. But the other side of it is uh, what he's saying, we are fools for Christ's sake. That means we will not trust in our own wisdom. We will not trust in our own intellect. Uh, we will come to Christ as people who know nothing so that God himself can give us the wisdom and his wisdom is revealed through us. So we don't, uh, we allow God to use our intellect. We allow God to uh, use our knowledge, but our heart and our posture before God is, I know nothing. Uh, and if I know anything, it must be because you have revealed it to me. If I'm able to do anything, it must be because you have enabled me to do it. Yeah. Um, so that's a posture of weakness. That's a posture of uh, coming to God as a fool, um, and uh, and in that way, allowing God's wisdom to be seen in you. Um, so, verse eleven. Uh, to the present hour, we both hunger and thirst, and we are poorly clothed and beaten and homeless. Uh, so all of these things, um, again, he's just continuing to talk about the sacrifices that they have made, uh, continuing to talk about the hardships that they have faced as ministers. So while uh, the church was uh, trying to find things to be proud about, uh, here the apostles were um, suffering for the sake of the gospel. So it's a very different approach to the faith. 
uh, where one uh, group of people is priding themselves in what they believe, uh, this group of leaders that they are boasting in are actually uh, sacrificing and giving up a lot and um, and experiencing a lot of suffering uh, for the sake of the gospel. So he's calling them to that kind of suffering. Have that kind of mindset. Uh, don't uh, don't try to elevate yourselves uh, and don't try to find a place of um, eliteness in in society. Instead, uh, approach approach God with a heart of sacrifice, a willingness to suffer. Um, and uh, what he describes in verse 11 is actually true of many philosophers as well. So while um, these people are boasting in wisdom, uh, there were lots of philosophers who suffered a lot for their wisdom. So he's also kind of saying, yeah, you are boasting in philosophers, you are boasting in wisdom. And the kinds of sacrifices we are making is similar to the things that philosophers are doing. Uh, so the philosophers would do it because they they felt that they were proving the truth of their message uh, by their suffering for the sake of the message. And so in the same way, Paul is saying, we have suffered for the sake of this message because we believe in its truth. Um, and then verse 12, and we labor working with our own hands. So here he's coming to like what, uh, what we talked about in the beginning of Corinthians. Uh, he's he's going against what the philosophers would uh, would value so he's saying while you value only using your mind uh, we are working hard for the sake of the gospel so uh, we are not going to seek the praises of people so just because the philosophers say this we are not going to do it we are going to do whatever it takes for the gospel to be made known um, being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we endure. Being defamed, we entreat. We have been made as the filth of the world, the offscoring of all things until now. So um, basically, he's saying, even if other people are saying terrible things about us, we will respond in kindness. Uh, we have become uh, completely uh, worthless in the eyes of the world. Uh, but but this is not this is not what we're running after. We're not running after the praises of the world. Uh, we want to take Christ to people, and that is our goal. So if that means that the world looks at us as uh, garbage, then it's all right. Uh, that's not what we are running after. So um, we see here that Paul. Um, is almost where the people in the church were trying to find things to boast in to prove their own worth. Paul is going the opposite, uh, on the opposite side, and like talking about all of the all of the things that would be mocked, all of the things that would be looked down upon by people, and boasting in those things uh, in a way uh, to say that. He's not boasting in those things, but he's basically saying this is the suffering we have endured, but it is worth it. Uh, it is something that uh, we are willingly doing, right? So we are servants of Christ, like he uh, said um, in verse 1. So we are servants of Christ, so we are willingly entering into this kind of suffering for the sake of Christ. So that is something for us to consider as we go into ministry. Now, all of us uh, may not and probably will not uh, have all of these experiences that Paul had, but uh, to come to ministry with that willingness to sacrifice, to face hardship, um, to be seen as a fool by the world, uh, by the culture around us. Uh, so not trying to please the culture, uh, not trying to uh, be accepted by the world, uh, but fully being true to Christ in all that we do. Uh, and that is, that's very difficult, especially with um, 
social media and the exposure that that gives us, right? So anything we do uh, in the church usually is for everyone else to see. So the whole world gets to see what we're doing here. And it can be so difficult sometimes to stay true to what we believe uh, because we know that so many people are going to have a view about what we have said or what we have done. Um, and so uh, this is a challenge for us. How can we sacrifice all of those things, sacrifice the praises of people, uh, the things that uh, the world around us is running after, the culture around us is running after, uh, to only, only focus on Christ and only make Christ known through our lives and through our ministry. Um, and if that is our focus, that may mean uh, that we are looked down upon, that we are mocked, uh, that we are seen as fools, uh, that we physically uh, face uh, face harm. Uh, all of these things might be the case, uh, but uh, will our heart still be for staying true to the gospel and not giving that up for the sake of other comforts? Um, let's go on to verse 14 to 21. Oh, will somebody read that for us, please? First Corinthians chapter 4, verse 14 to 21. I do not write these things to shame you, but as my beloved children, I warn you. For though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. Therefore, I urge you, imitate me. For this reason, I have sent Timothy to you, who is my beloved and faithful son in the Lord who will remind you of my ways in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. Now some are puffed up as though I were not coming to you, but I'll come to you shortly, if the Lord wills. And I will know not the word of those who are puffed up, but the power. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. What do you want? Shall I come to you with a rod or in love and spirit of gentleness? having some problems with my headphones. Okay um, so verse 14, I do not write these things to shame you, but as my beloved children, I warn you. So uh, we go into this next section where uh, Paul is talking to them as a father, uh, where before this he was uh, talking as a church leader, uh, as someone who had, uh, was serving them, who had uh, raised up this church. Now he moves into uh, recognizing this relationship that they have, that he has with them, uh, because he was the one who took the gospel to them and they uh, responded to it. And so it became like a spiritual father to them. Uh, and so he reminds them of that relationship, uh, which is so important, uh, right? When we are bringing correction uh, and when we are calling people to uh, change something about the way they're doing things, to have that uh, strong relationship with them uh, and for them to be able to trust that what we're saying is coming out of love. Uh, so when we correct, when we uh, discipline that all of that is coming from a place of true concern and a, a relationship that we share with them. Uh, so he says, as my beloved children, I warn you. Uh, so this heart of love and tenderness towards them. Uh, verse 15, for though you might have 
10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers. Uh, for in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. Uh, so instructors would be uh, like teachers or tutors to uh, children in school. Right? So he was saying there are many people who may be teaching you things um, and, and showing you uh, things from the, from the scriptures. They may be teaching you in that way. But there are not many people who have this relationship that we have. Uh, so I was able to bring the gospel uh, to you. And in a way, you were birthed into the kingdom uh, through this gospel. And so I'm like that a father to you, because I was responsible for that birthing into the kingdom. Um, and um, because we have this strong relationship, you can trust that what I'm saying is coming from that heart of a father. Uh, so this is uh, an important thing to look at. What does it mean to be a true spiritual father? Because we see this term used a lot uh, in the church, uh, the spiritual father, the spiritual mother. Um, but sometimes it can be misused, or sometimes it can be uh, it can be twisted, or people can use it to. Uh, gain authority over people or to control people. So from this passage, we can look at what does it mean to be a spiritual father? How did Paul relate to the church as a spiritual father? Uh, the first thing is that he not only birthed them into the kingdom through the gospel, but he also took them from immaturity to maturity. So he continued to be involved in the church, even if he was not physically present with them. Uh, he continued to uh, stay up to date with what was happening in the church. Uh, and uh, as we see in this letter, he was addressing issues within the church to make sure that they were um, they were not straying away from the truth of God. So this is important uh, that we have, we take that kind of responsibility. That we're not going to just go and uh, bring people to Christ and then move away and forget about them. Uh, but if we are to be a spiritual parent to them, that we also take responsibility for them growing in the faith. Uh, now, this, um, this is in the case of someone who is a, uh, called to be a spiritual parent to someone. Now, in some cases, we may not have the opportunity to continue to encourage people in this way, to continue to build them up. Say, if we've shared the gospel uh, to someone on the road, uh, we may not have the opportunity to then go and see them grow in faith. Uh, but uh, in this context where a church has been planted, uh, Paul continues to see that the church grows in faith. Uh, the second thing is that uh, the spiritual father or mother allows other people to teach the sons and daughters. So Apollos was allowed to teach. Uh, Paul um, sends Timothy to them. So there are other people who are being sent to them to teach and equip and instruct them. Uh, it should not be that uh, a spiritual father or mother says, I should be the only one teaching you. And if anyone else comes, don't listen to them. Uh, if that is the case, then it is a sign, it's a dangerous sign because uh, it could be a sign of a cult where uh, there's a lot of control over the people who are following the leader. Uh, they don't allow them uh, to go out of their uh, teaching, to go out of their fold. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of like limiting them and uh, not allowing them to go to people outside. Uh, so that could be a problem. Uh, the third thing is that a uh, spiritual father or mother sets an example for the sons and daughters. So they, by their lives, by the way they are living, they are setting an, an example and they are calling the children to follow their way of life. Uh, and we see Paul talk about that in verse 16. Um, and the last point is uh, that he's able to raise up. So the spiritual parent raises up uh, children who will walk in the same grace and the same uh, kind of training that they themselves had. 
right? So you're raising up leaders who can walk uh, as equals with you, and sometimes who can even be greater than you. Uh, so there should never be the mindset of I'm going to teach you, but only to a certain limit, so that you you don't overtake me, or uh, so that your ministry never becomes greater than mine. That sense of insecurity should not be there in a spiritual parent. Um, their heart should be to raise this person up to their level and uh, and even beyond them, so that the work of God continues to grow. Okay, so. Um, uh, this is that also reflects the heart of Jesus. So Jesus said, "You will do greater things than me." Jesus didn't say, "Okay, you will do everything I can do, but not this or not that." He said, "You will do things that are greater than what I did." Uh, so that should be the heart of a spiritual father. Oh, and then there's another point I missed. So uh, the fifth point is um, a spiritual parent also should know when to discipline and when to uh, respond with gentleness, right? So there should be discipline and correction that comes in uh, when it's needed. And there should be times of uh, bringing correction with gentleness uh, and with love. So knowing when to respond and how to respond. So I think we covered all of those verses in those points. Um, verse 16 talks about imitating, uh, Paul calling them to imitate him. Uh, verse 17 uh, talks about Timothy, who Paul has raised as a son. So here is the example that Paul has raised somebody up, and uh, this person is able to do the work that Paul is doing. So where we've raised leaders up to be able to continue the work uh, that is that we were doing. Um, verse 18 is just uh, 18 and 19, um, right? He's talking about coming to them uh, and coming to them to correct them, to bring correction. Uh, Yeah, and then verse 20, for the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. So this goes back to what Paul talked about earlier in this letter. Um, in, verse, uh, in chapter 2, verse 4, he says, My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with the demonstration of the Spirit's power. So he's repeating that again, that it's not in my speech, not in speech or in uh, discourse that God's kingdom is revealed. Um, it is in power of the spirit. And so um, he's saying that that is the kind of transformation you want to see in the church. Uh, the transformation should be in uh, the way they live, not just in the words that they are using. And uh, he's uh, saying that specifically about the people who were boasting, uh, the people who were talking as if Paul was not going to come back. Uh, so that he says in verse 18, some of you are puffed up as if I was not coming back, but I will come back to you shortly. Uh, and I will know, uh, I'll come back to you shortly if the Lord wills, and I will know not the word of those who are puffed up, but the power. Right? So they, he'll be able to see whether they, they really have the power that they are boasting in. For the kingdom of God, it's not in word, but in power. Okay, any questions so, so far before we move to chapter 5? Yeah, go ahead. So uh, we saw in the introduction that Paul spent 18 months uh, in Corinth, as far as I know. Mm. Yeah. So here he says about going back, I'll shortly come back to you. So I'm just out of curiosity, I'm asking, did he ever go back or, you know? Um, 
Okay, I I believe that he does go back after this, uh, but I'll have to check when he goes back and uh, at what point he goes back in his ministry. Anyone else? Okay, we'll move on to chapter five then. So, uh, so far we see that Paul was addressing this issue of disunity within the church. Uh, now he moves on to another issue, uh, and that was uh, sexual immorality, sexual sin that was in the church. So, in this chapter, in the first five verses, uh, he talks about how to respond to sin in the church. Uh, in verses six to eight, he goes back to uh, something from the Old Testament, uh, so the Passover and the unleavened bread, and he uses that to explain what the church is supposed to be like, uh, and uses those pictures, those images to. Uh, to talk about how there should be purity within the church. Um, and then verses uh, 9 to 13, he talks about what will be the result of willful sin. So uh, there's a difference between uh, committing a sin uh, once and repenting versus continuing to walk in sin uh, without turning back or without repenting. So uh, chapter 5, verses 1 to 5, uh, is anyone willing to read that? Uh, I'll read the chapter First Corinthians. Chapter 5, verse 1 to 5. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles, that a man has his father's wife, and you are puffed up, and have not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from you. For I need, as absent in body but present in spirit, have already judged as though I were present him who has so done this deed in the name of our lord jesus christ when you are gathered together along with my spirit with the power of our lord jesus christ deliver such a one to satan for the destruction of the flesh that his spirit may be saved in the day of the lord jesus Uh, thank you, John. Sorry, uh, my headset seems to have decided to stop working. So, uh, but uh, thank you for reading verses one to five. So let's go into that. Um, so verse one, it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that even pagans do not tolerate. A man is sleeping with his father's wife. Um, so uh, Paul is talking about a sin, and uh, the worst thing is that it's not only a sin that uh, would be considered wrong within the church, but even people who do not follow God, people outside the church, would see this as 
a terrible sin. Like everybody recognized that this was wrong. But somehow the church in Corinth has not addressed it. Uh, and um, and in fact, like he says in verse 2, they are even proud about it. So we'll talk a little bit about what uh, exhibit pride um, in response to it. But um, but somehow the church had not uh, had not addressed it and had not considered it as a problem. And so Paul is very shocked that he says a man is sleeping with his father's wife. So uh, it's implying that this is something that is still happening. It's not uh, something that happened once and stopped or was happening and then stopped. Uh, it's something that is still going on. That sin is still continuing. Uh, and the church has not done anything about it. Now, uh, we know clearly from scripture that this was wrong. Uh, in the Old Testament, uh, if somebody can read maybe one of these verses, uh, maybe we can look at Deuteronomy 27.20. Yeah. I read, Cass is one who lies with his um, father's wife because he has uncovered his father's bed, and all the people shall say, Amen. Okay. Uh, thank you. Sorry, I still can't hear, but I could see, brother, that you were, uh, brother Paul, that you were reading. Um, thank you. Uh, so, yeah, we see in Deuteronomy 27, 20, that it's clearly mentioned uh, that the person who lies with their father's wife will be cursed. So in scripture, it's clearly revealed that what they were doing was sinful. Uh, but even if it was not in scripture, even the outside culture uh, would not approve of what was happening. Uh, but the church, instead of correcting it or dealing with it or even uh, addressing the issue, uh, they had become proud about it. Um, now that pride, it's not clear from scripture itself how they were exhibiting pride. Uh, the one way it might have been uh, seen is that they were thinking we are being tolerant, we are um, we are showing our religious freedom uh, that we uh, do not have to be um, fearful or uh, we don't have to be under any strict rules, uh, but we have freedom in our faith. And uh, so we will allow this person to continue in their sin uh, without, without bringing strict correction. Um, so Paul says, shouldn't you rather have gone into mourning and put out of your fellowship the man who was doing this? So uh, there are two responses. He's, uh, he's, he's telling them, we should have seen this. This is the right kind of response to sin. Uh, the first is that you yourself e uh, express sadness over what has happened. Uh, because your brother has fallen uh, and your brother is uh, living a life of immorality. Uh, so there should be a heartfelt uh, response to that. And on the other hand, there should also be some strict discipline that follows. And that discipline is to put them out of fellowship with the church. Uh, verse Three. For my part, even though I'm not physically present, I'm with you in spirit. So Paul is talking about being there uh, 
like a father, like having that intimacy with them. Uh, he is with them even if he's not there in person. Uh, his heart is with them and his concern for what is happening is very much real, like he is with them in person. Um, as one who is present with you in this way, I have already passed judgment in the name of our Lord Jesus on the one who has been doing this. Uh, so he is doing this in the name of Jesus. So his correction and judgment doesn't come based on uh, his own um, his own authority, but it is in the authority of Jesus and the authority that he has as uh, a leader uh, put over this church. So Paul has been uh, given that leadership and authority by Jesus. And so whatever he's doing is within the authority that has been given to him. Um, verse 4. So when you are assembled and I am with you in spirit and the power of our Lord Jesus is present, hand this man over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved on the day of the Lord. Uh, so uh, when they come together, Paul's heart and his uh, his thinking, all of that will be like he is with them. Uh, but the power of the Lord will be with them. So it is the power of the Lord that will enable them to do what they have to do. And uh, what he's instructing them to do is give this man over to Satan. So what does that mean, to uh, give that man over to Satan? Uh, it means that this person will no longer be included within the fellowship of the church. So he's going to be put outside of the fellowship. Uh, and because he's not in fellowship with the church, that means he is also uh, exposed to, uh, to uh, Satan's work in his life. So the church will no longer be protecting him. He is going to be outside and he is going to have to battle whatever Satan puts his way in by himself. And the objective of that is to bring him to repentance. So it's not that he will be destroyed, that he will be punished. Uh, but the objective is that he will come back to the Lord when he realizes uh, what he has lost. And he's realized, uh, when he realizes um, that that fellowship uh, and the protection that he has when he's within the church body uh, is what uh, will keep him in line with Christ and is what he should really be chasing after. Um, so we'll talk more about this. This is a difficult verse to end on. But uh, since we've reached the end of our time, we'll stop here and we'll uh, continue from here next week. Uh, just a reminder that I'll post the question for your assignment on Google Classroom today. And uh, you all can submit your assignments by Monday next week. Thank you. Have a good week.